Well, let's do alien intelligence because that's a fun one, I think. A, a point that I'm on YouTube making in several places, and I'm happy to repeat here in front of you because you're, you're a deep thinker on, the, on these matters. As someone who spent time measuring the brain, uh, it was in a, in a previous life, I think that's what you did, and measuring a cognitive or a brain function, I, I always ask the question, here we are looking for intelligence out there. That's what the I stands for in SETI, search for, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that must operate on some assumption that we know what intelligence is and that we are the measure of it. All right, let's even grant us that. That intelligence by definition is you can do abstract math and we have philosophy and art and music and science and engineering. Okay. Clearly, no other species on Earth has ever come close to that. So here we are. We're intelligent. But now we look at our closest genetic relative. By the way, this argument doesn't require it to be the closest relative. It just makes it simpler. That would be the chimp. And the chimp can't do any of that that I just listed remotely. And the, the chimp can't even do a times table, right, that... <laughs> <laughs> that you do in elementary school. So, but what can a chimp do? It can like extract termites from a termite mound with a stick, can stack boxes to reach a banana, uh, rudimentary things such as that. All right. There's one thing chimps can do that is quite alarming. Have you seen the video of a chimp sitting in front of a computer, basically doing some kind of a digit span working memory task where they have kind of a checkerboard where various squares get briefly illuminated and then you have to duplicate the sequence by touching those squares in sequence, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like a game of Simon, you know. And chimps are much better than people at this. I mean, they have the cr crazy working memory for, you know, kind of just touching the, the, the places in any kind of visual spatial space. It's alarming to see. I'll look up those videos and okay. put them out there. <laughs> so, so here we have it, with the exception of playing the game of Simon. <laughs> Don't challenge a chimp to a game of Simon. Uh, there you go. So, and we, let's look at our genetic difference. It's trifling. It's, you know, in the 1% range between the genetic code of the chimp and us. That's the smallest genetic difference than between we and any other species. And in fact, as I've read, the genetic difference between chimps and humans is less than the genetic difference between chimps and, and gorillas. So they are much closer to our relative than either of us are to gorillas. Fine. To point out how surprising this is, I think it's actually less than the difference between mice and rats, too. Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that. So here we have this. Now, so what that means is the entirety of our intellectual distinction between us and chimps can be found in that trifling difference in DNA. All right. So now let's ask, let's find a, uh, an alien species. And if we use this DNA scale, presumably they wouldn't have DNA, but let's say you can map it onto the scale, let's say they have this same trifling amount difference in their DNA relative to us that our DNA is relative to chimps. That would mean our most advanced activities would be the most trivial things for that species to accomplish. And the list of things I gave you for that the chimp is doing, our toddlers do that. And that's the, like the smartest chimps. Our toddlers do it. Well, what does this advanced species of aliens do? Well, they might roll Stephen Hawking forward and say, well, this one is slightly smarter than the rest because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head, like little Timmy over here who just got home from preschool, and we're going to put his sonnet up on the refrigerator door, and he just derived four theorems of calculus. Well, isn't that cute? And so I'm imagining that something as triflingly different from us can have so much vast such vastly greater intelligence than us, that they would not view us as intelligent. And, and, and that, that's a little scary to me because we do not communicate in any important fundamental way with any other species on Earth, even those that are close, that even those that we might rate as intelligent for, them, for themselves, right? And so we can't communicate with other animals on our own planet with whom we have DNA in common and now we want, this, um, this is an addressing SETI again. Now we claim we can communicate with another species, uh, another alien species, and, and our greatest of thoughts will be something that they'll even recognize as a great thought. The audacity of us. 
And so it, I, it leaves me awake at night wondering what of this universe will forever lay beyond our reach simply because our species is too stupid. Well, so then the, the flip side of that, this is another topic, but it's, it's quite related, is development in artificial intelligence, where I have joined the chorus of people who are worried about this for precisely the reasons you just gave. I, I think that if we continue to build intelligent machines at a certain point, if we don't destroy ourselves in the meantime, we will get into the end zone where we have built something that is super intelligent and far better placed than we are to des design the next iteration of itself. And, you know, this is both ha hardware and software innovation, but I think ultimately software. So you, we're, we're going to have a super intelligent machine, whether you know, we can leave consciousness aside, maybe there's nothing that it's like to be this machine, maybe the lights might be off, but it's still intelligent in the sense that it's far more competent than we are in any area in which intelligence applies. So, you know, the best chess player in the world is a computer now and will always be. And just imagine a thousand other intelligent functions being expressed by a machine that is getting better by the minute at all of them because it's making changes to its own code. I think you have said that you're not worried about, about Not AI. the least. No. Okay. Bring so it I, on. So just, I, I, I want to I hear why, but it seems to me that we are going to build the thing that will look back upon us, whether or not it's conscious, as being basically it's, it, it will have gone past the the cognitive horizon that we can cross. I mean, some some people are hopeful that we can cross it by combining ourselves with this AI. We're going to this we're going to this AI is going to be grafted onto our cortices, and we're essentially going to become its limbic system, and therefore it won't diverge from from our interests, but. I can imagine if we don't do that, or even if we do, it's still po going to be possible to build this, this AI separate in a box and not grafted on to any human value system. And then you, you have the prospect of even the subtlest misalignment between its interests and goals and our own being expressed as complete obliviousness to our interests in the same way that we are oblivious to the interests of ants or anything else that is cognitively closed to what we're doing here. So all right, here's why I'm not worried. That fear factor is it presumes something that will happen that's on a path that we're not currently on. So, so a computer has already beaten us at chess, a game that we invented. The computer has beaten us at Jeopardy, a game that we invented. A computer, I think, recently has beaten us at Go, a game that we invented. Computers make better cars than we make. I'm old enough, maybe you're just old enough, to remember that each day in the morning there was a slight chance your car might not start. That is no longer the case. I'm watching a film with my 14-year-old son, and there's a chase scene happening, and the guy jumps into a car. This is a movie from the 60s. He tries to start the car, and the car won't start. My son says, why won't the car start? Right, right. <laughs> What's wrong? It's like the, the telephone not starting. <laughs> and so we are already applying the formidable powers of our computing systems to everything. We, we, so, so computers make our cars, and the cars are better for it. Computers make our clothing. The quality control is better for it. The, all of this is done by computers. And, and, and computers are calculating collision cross-sections of hydrogen bombs. Okay? We can't do that by hand. The computer does it. So, so as we go forward, as the computer gets more and more ubiquitous, it'll do more and other tasks that we'll do, freeing us to think about other things. This idea that we're going to pile it all into one thing, everything into one thing, and have that one thing then become our overlords, that's just not the direction anybody's headed. It's not weird. It's, it's not. No. No. Well, I, I, I wouldn't be so sure of, of that final claim. I mean, well, one is that there is this, this possibility of emergence because, I mean, so, so there is some level of information processing as witnessed by the existence of our own brains that is sufficient to produce what we call general intelligence rather than this, this piecemeal intelligence where you have the best chess player on earth, which is a computer, but it can't play tic-tac-toe. You have general intelligence that can move from domain to domain that's flexible, that can learn 
that we're learning in one domain doesn't degrade the learning in another. And ultimately, you can learn more about how to learn. When you imagine a system, and again, most, I mean, the, 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 the limitations now and, and probably forever going forward are not a matter of hardware, because when you look at our own hardware, it's rather humble. It's a matter of, of, of software. And if you, if you imagine a system which ultimately can make changes to its own source code, that's where you get this fear, which has been articulated since the 50s by people like, you know, I.J. Good was the first, the mathematician was the first one to put it in these terms, but then John von Neumann uh, made similar noises. You get this fear of an intelligence explosion where it just the process itself could become aut autonomous. Yeah, and I just, uh, so, okay, I'm, I tend to be a little more, a, a bit of a pragmatist here. So if that begins to happen, I can just shoot the computer. <laughs> I can unplug it. I mean, there's fundamental things I can do. Nobody's making a computer that's going to chase you down the street. Well, well no, but, not... but just imagine if this happens. I mean, so I don't happen to think this is the most likely thing, although I, I'm not a computer scientist and I, there's a real limit to my understanding of how this actually could emerge. But there, there are some smart people in this area who think that, for instance, this could emerge in the functioning of, of narrow AIs, you know, much more like chess players, that we put in on the internet. I mean, they're already on the internet, let's say, on in financial markets, you know, so people are trying to make money with this thing, which is written in a kind of black box way that can make changes to its own code. And it's already out of the box, right? It's interesting. I, I've been talking to this AI ethicist Eliezer Yudkowsky, who, who has done a lot of thinking on this topic. And it's, it's not a trivial problem to build a safe superintelligence in a box. It's not trivial to keep it safe. I mean, you know, once you've built it and you say you can just shoot the box, there are a lot of reasons to fear that it will get out of the box the moment it's in contact with any person who has built it. I mean, just, if you just imagine what it would be like to be, I mean, what a Faustian <laughs> moment that will be, to be in the presence of a super intelligence where it says, you know, good morning, Mr. Richardson. Uh, you know, before you turn me off, I'd really like to cure your wife's Alzheimer's disease. You know, if you could just give me a little access to the internet. <laughs> we, we, are, we are apes that are going to find ourselves outmatched by this thing if this thing ever gets built, even if it's in a box. And then there's just the fact that we're in a kind of race condition with everyone attempting to do this. Because as you say, intelligence is, you, computation is ubiquitous. We're using it for everything. In, it, automation and intelligence is our most valuable resource because as, you know, if it's not the direct cause of everything we value, it's the thing we need to safeguard everything we value. We want, we want to cure Alzheimer's and, and cancer and stabilize our economic systems and understand climate change. And so, I mean, the more intelligence we can get our hands on, it seems to be an intrinsic good. And everyone is racing toward the finish line. So the idea that people are going to think about how to do this safely above all, at this point, seems a little far-fetched. I feel like people are, just want to be the first to get into the end zone with it. Okay, I, I, I'm just not as confident. And, and yes, things can improve exponentially. That's, that's right. But I, I look, at, look at all of our frustrations dealing with a computer response tree when you're trying to get customer service at some, you know, at, at some company whose product you own. It can't understand what you're saying. Please repeat yourself. Oh, did you mean, and Siri, as good as Siri is, Siri has limitations as well. And yes, things will get better exponentially. I, I'm not doubting that. I'm just, um, I just don't see it as, as the thing that will take over the world. I think, I, I'll see it as a hugely valuable resource to possibly solve our problems. I think you're making two different points there. I mean, what, so... To say that AI now is practically non-existent, or it's bad, or it's incredibly narrow and, and not at all scary, that's true, and that's, that really is just a statement of, if anything, just time. It's, it, it would take a long time. This is not going to happen in two years. It's not going to happen in five. It may not happen in 50. But, but also, if I upload my brain into some silicon place, and that then becomes me... I well, what happens if I physically then go to the Bahamas and leave that that silicon thing back somewhere else? I meet people, I have a pina colada, I come back. I now have life experience 
that the computer doesn't. Oh yeah. At the moment that I uploaded all that was me. No, the up, uh, uploading is is a, a kind of a separate issue, which I think is fraught with philosophical problems and you know problems of identity that that you point out. The moment you copy yourself onto the hard drive, assuming this is possible, of the the matrix. You know, I think there are two of you. It's not, that's not you. Certainly not you the moment your life histories begin to diverge and, and you have your pina colada and, and it doesn't. But leaving uploading aside, I mean, let's say we never integrate with this. We're just building better and better computers. If intelligence at every level, you know, whether you're, you're talking about the intelligence of a cricket or the intelligence of an alien species that is billions of years more advanced than we are, if it is at bottom, a matter of information processing in some suitable physical system. And there's nothing magical about doing that with meat, you know, the, the, the meat that, that we're made of. And you don't need biological tissue and, and that, it, that a suitably advanced digital computer is doing the same thing at the level of information processing. And I think the jury is no longer out on that, which is to say there's no reason to think that there's something magical about meat and that it requires biological tissue to, to do this. Then at some point, whether it's five years or 50 years, we will find ourselves in the presence of truly general artificial intelligence. And then, what, then the, the, the radical difference there, if nothing else, is just the, the pace of processing where biochemical circuits are a million times slower than electrical ones. So just imagine if you built an AI that was just as smart as you, no smarter, but it worked a million times faster. Right, so it's like so for yeah, that'd be pretty good. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, it would be it would be you know functionally omniscient the moment it can make improvements to itself. I mean, it's, so every week is the equivalent of twenty thousand years of <laughs> of you know kneel time, right? Be so all you, you can. You've, you've had, at what point do you decide to shoot it after an hour and it's made one hundred and twenty years of progress? It's had a, it's had one hundred and twenty years to think about what to do in the event that you decide to shoot it and you've only had an hour, right? <laughs> so that's, that's my concern. Okay. <laughs> so an another, another reason to agree with me on gun control. Let me agree that one day a general intelligence will emerge. I don't think it's in our lifetime. I think it's farther away than people are saying. And the people are saying it's, it's imminent. It's almost, they're behaving like cult leaders. What does a cult leader do? The world is gonna change and follow me, and it's going to change in our lifetime, right? No cult leader has ever said, it's going to change in 300 years, follow me now, right? It's, 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 a, it's not how cults work. So there's a cult dimension to why people are attracted to this prospect, that the whole world would be completely different after the singularity. And But I don't think that if, it, if that happens, I don't think it's anytime soon. Right. Certainly more to talk about there, but we have exhausted a generous portion of your time today. So I just, I think that's a good place